to all. My name is Francisca. Uh, I'm your host tonight. I'm looking forward to an hour and a half with amazing guests talking about a topic that is all close to everyone's heart. No pun intended. Uh, we want to talk about health, healthcare, and the profit oriented healthcare system we are all living under. Uh, I'm speaking to you from Berlin, Berlin in Germany, where there's now talk of introducing co payments of up to 2,000 euros for patients because apparently the budgets are too tight. But also, just recently, we learned that Moderna, Pfizer and BioNTech alone made billions of profits of COVID vaccines, for which they also receive public funding and they pay less taxes for. Um, and it makes it impossible and make it impossible through intellectual property and patent rights to produce vaccines uh, in cheaper ways for different countries. And of course, Western governments are complicit in these um, in this crime against humanity, which was famously shown when the German chancellor spoke out against the patent waiver in March 2021. Uh, that's not the only bad news around health and healthcare. Half the world lacks access to essential health services, as the uh, World Health Organization put out in one of its studies. 100 million people a year are still pushed into extreme poverty because of health expenses. And then, of course, we've seen recently uh, that a lot of the burden is put on the medical professionals and their unions. We've seen amazing strikes around the world, uh, lastly in Britain, uh, where actually our where our own where our own healthcare professionals have to defend the patients and their working conditions against the world worst onslaught of capitalism. So overall, it's not very difficult to imagine a better system and to have a really long wish list where hospitals have ample resources where care workers are compensated as they deserve and treated with dignity, where the newest of scientific research benefits all in terms of medication and treatment. Usually we are told that's not really feasible and it's not affordable and we should you know, take more individual responsibility for our health or we will only receive uh, medication if we grant the profits to the pharmaceutical industry or the health insurance companies. We do have examples of humane and better healthcare um, we do have uh, historically and now struggles that we see that things could be done better and we want to talk about those today. And I want to bring on three amazing speakers for tonight who will, this is the good thing, they will introduce themselves very briefly um, before we then go into the longer contributions and the topics that we want to talk about today. Let's start, um, let's start with Matthew. 30 seconds, go. Uh, thanks, Francisca. Um, yeah, I'm a researcher at the Internationale Forschungsstelle DDR, which translates to the International Research Center GDR. Um, and our objective uh, here is to re-examine socialism from the 20th century uh, and draw out the lessons for the future. Um, obviously, we're mainly focused on the German Democratic Republic, but uh, we also look at uh, its relations with the rest of the socialist camp and also with the third world. Um, we work with Tricontinental Institute for Social Research on a series called Studies on the GDR or Studies on the DDR. Uh, and uh, our latest publication is looking at the healthcare system. And it's just been translated and published into English, Portuguese, and Spanish. Uh, I think we're going to be posting the link in the chat shortly as well. So this is what I will be drawing on today, this publication. Yeah. Thank you. Sopo, please. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. I'm Sopo Japarite. I, uh, I live in Georgia and I'm a trade union leader. Uh, it's a general union, general service and healthcare union. And I also tend to do research as well, uh, especially our research in healthcare and also the working conditions of nurses. And I also run a podcast about reimagining Soviet Georgia to re-examine a lot of um, history that's distorted about this about Soviet Union and particularly around Soviet Georgia. Thank you. Thank you, Sopo. Janneke, please. Hello, everybody. I'm Janneke uh, Ronse, and um, I was a nurse, and I'm now the chair of uh, the Belgian organization Medics for the People. And I will hope to you, uh, I hope tonight I will discuss with you how uh, the profit motive is compromising public health and uh, distorting medical services uh, in Belgium and um, how we work with Medics for the People to as address this issue um, by organizing our own primary care uh, practices 
and uh, how we link it with a larger political action. Thank you, Yannicke. Thank you. Welcome all three of you and welcome to all the viewers out there. Um, I guess just a small, smallest housekeeping notes. We do, we have planned to uh, answer questions also after the interventions that everybody here will give so that we have a common ground to, on which to debate. Um, so please post post questions in the post questions uh, in, in the chat at any time. Uh, we will try to see where we are with time, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, to make sure that uh, we ask a variety of questions of these speakers. Let's get straight to the interventions. We'll start uh, with Matthew. Um, obviously, you know, the goal cannot be to just hear history lessons of the details and numbers of this really small country that the GDR used to be. Um, but there are principles and mechanisms and rules that they followed um, underlying sort of the, the, the state, like what, what the, the idea of how the state wanted to prepare healthcare for its people. And some of it, some of it can probably be learned or there's maybe some lessons to be drawn around a more socialist practice around healthcare that is not profit oriented. And so please uh, take it away and explain to us how that worked. Yeah, thanks, Francisca. Um, I have some slides that I've also prepared uh, for the presentation. Um, obviously, as you say, I'm not going to try to summarize 45 years of East German health policy uh, into just 15 minutes. So um, what I'm going to try to do is basically uh, outline the basic characteristics and guiding principles of, of socialist healthcare using the GDR as an example. Um, so sort of the question is, what characterizes the socialist approach to health? Uh, let me try and get up these slides here. Yeah, there we go. Um, so before we begin, I thought it'd be helpful to provide a bit of historical context of where we are. So it's 1945, uh, the Second World War comes to an end, in Europe at least, and Germany is divided into four occupation zones. Um, the areas here in green, blue, and orange uh, are then united by the capitalist powers to become the Federal Republic of Germany, or as it's commonly known, Western Germany. And then five months later, in response to this, in the red zone here, um, it becomes the German Democratic Republic or East Germany. And so we have these two states then, uh, two German states. And it's interesting because we then have two very different uh, paths that are followed. In the West, we have a restoration, not only of monopoly capitalism, but also of traditional medical practices. And then in the East, we have a new beginning. We have uh, a gradual transition to socialized property relations and this serves as, a, as, as the basis for a revolution in, in, health, in the health system, both in terms of care and also in the working conditions. And it's this approach in the East that we looked at in our, in our publication. Um, this new beginning in the East is led by anti-fascists, mostly communists and social democrats, who are emerging out of uh, the Nazi concentration camps or they're returning from exile. And they basically find themselves in a situation um, that's catastrophic, you know, I mean, Germany, uh, the German fascism had propagated this idea of total war until the very end. So throughout Eastern Europe, you just have a catastrophic con uh, health conditions. You know, hospitals and clinics have been destroyed. There's no access to medicine. Diseases like typhus and dysentery are spreading uncontrollably. And on top of that, in Germany, uh, you have the problem that about 45% of doctors had been Nazi party members. Uh, many of them had even been involved in euthanasia and other atrocities in the concentration camps. So you were confronted with the question, what do you do with these, with these doctors? Many of them actually end up fleeing uh, the Soviet occupation zone and they go to the West because they know they'll be treated more leniently there. And so from the very beginning, you have uh, a very large shortage of doctors in the East. Uh, now to tackle this situation, uh, the East German health officials basically set out to construct a new system. And they did so by drawing on progressive traditions, uh, the first of which was what's called the field of social medicine uh, or public health, as it's usually uh, called today. And it sort of emerged in the mid 19th century. Um, and then it's taken up by the labor movement after that. Uh, but what social medicine does is it looks at the interaction between people's health and their social conditions. So in other words, what we call the social determinants of health. So working conditions, housing, nutrition, education, our social relationships, our free time, all this kind of, all of these factors, they basically form the basis upon which our physical and mental health develops. So this was the first tradition and the second tradition were the experiences uh, from the Soviet Union where health officials had actually put social medicine 
into practice through a unitary and centralized national healthcare system. And officials in East Germany, they also recognized that um, it would be necessary to separate people's medical needs from private economic interests. So just to provide an example of this, if we look at the outpatient sector, this is where um, care is administered outside of the hospital system. So like if you go uh, to your general practitioner for primary care, you know, getting a blood test or having an examination. Well, in the capitalist outpatient sector, it's usually uh, done by self-employed doctors in private practices. Uh, they're working in their own practice, basically. And the problem here is that they're financially dependent on sick people coming to them for treatment. Uh, that's how they charge insurance companies, and that's how they generate their income. So these self-employed doctors are essentially incentivized not to prevent disease, but to treat symptoms after they've already manifest. Uh, and this is not a this is not something that the GDR discovered. You know, I mean, this was a fact that had been discussed by progressive health experts long before the GDR was founded. Also, in the League of Nations following the First World War, this had also been a topic. But the problem was is that conservative physicians associations who had an economic interest in the old model, they uh, opposed all attempts to modernize outpatient care. And so this was the the basic task that then the German East German uh, health officials set themselves was separating healthcare from private economic interests. So how was this done? Well, basically it required the nationalization of healthcare institutions and the guaranteed right to healthcare. So in the socialist states, free medical, tra free medical treatment was to be provided through a unitary healthcare and insurance system. So all health institutions from hospitals, clinics, pharmacies, research centers, and so on, they were all managed and planned by different levels of government. As you can see in this graph here, which shows the structure of the health system at the regional or municipal level, you know, it's not fragmented between publicly funded services on one hand and privately organized care facilities on the other, as many of us know from capitalist systems today. But it's actually, it's a unified system in which all these health facilities cooperate and they're led by the Ministry of Health and its departments. And by, by linking these various institutions together in this way, it became possible in the social states to integrate preventive, therapeutic, and aftercare measures, uh, something that's really greatly hindered by the fragmented model of outpatient care where, you know, for example, you have little contact between doctors who are administering therapeutic care and those that are administering aftercare or the pharmacists that are providing medication and so on. They're all fragmented in the capitalist system. So with this unitary approach, Emphasis in East Germany could now be placed on prophylaxis, which is the medical approach that tries to prevent disease before it manifests instead of just focusing on, on treating symptoms. And by pairing prophylaxis with social medicine, it becomes possible to approach health policy from a socio-political perspective. So how are, health con how are working conditions, housing, social relationships, and so on, how are they affecting our health? And once we've established this link, what do we do about it? Well, the key development in the socialist states is that you have this gradual creation of socialist property relations. And this was crucial because it meant that all these social determinants of health could now be managed by the state and its decision-making structures. So you have, a, a through this large network of public outpatient, outpatient facilities that are operating in all areas of society, you had a way of systematically investigating and tackling everyday health risks you know, in the neighborhood, the schools, the universities, um, the workplace, all of these institutions are basically integrated into the healthcare system. And so with these two guiding principles, prevention and social medicine, the protection of health uh, comes to be understood not as an individual responsibility, but as a social responsibility. So I've just taken a few pictures here to provide some examples uh, from the left to the right. And on the left, we have uh, the workplace where public health officials would carry out inspections to make sure that working conditions are monitored and that workers are receiving care that's really tailored specifically to the relevant health risks like chemical exposure or heavy lifting and so on. In the middle, we then have residential areas where health inspectors are tied to the local outpatient facilities and they're measuring noise or air pollution in the neighborhood uh, and monitoring health in daily life. And uh, in kindergartens and schools, you have then medical checkups and vaccinations carried out directly by the pediatricians on site. So it's no longer left to parents to organize and keep track of various appointments for their children. And so in this way, we have to think of socialist healthcare as kind of a holistic 
and comprehensive system that's integrated into all areas of society. And it would accompany people from throughout their life, from kindergarten, through the school, through the workplace, and all the way into the neighborhood where people would retire. And so what's the infrastructure that supports this socialist approach to healthcare? Um, it's, it's a massive outpatient network primarily, um, and we can't go into each of the aspects here, but I think it's worth highlighting the polyclinic because it kind of uh, epitomizes or embodies the, the socialist approach. Now, the polyclinic uh, was basically a facility in which multiple medical, medical specialties are collaborating under one roof. Uh, as you can see in this cross-section example here, there are several core departments like general medicine, pediatrics, gynecology, internal and oral medicine, and a surgery department. But polyclinics usually also then had other departments like laboratories for diagnostics, physiotherapy, medical imaging, and so on. And these polyclinics were to be sort of the central nodes in the wider outpatient network, which included smaller facilities and also mobile care units, such as like community nurse or uh, mobile dental services that would then reach more remote rural areas. And the idea was that all these facilities were linked together to facilitate collaboration and mutual support amongst them. And so why is this polyclinic then designed to replace the traditional model of individual private practices? Well, it was recognized that this private practice model uh, of outpatient care is outdated. And there were two reasons for this. First, as I already mentioned, the self-employed doctor uh, in the private practice is economically interested in treatment, not in prevention. But secondly, there have also been advances in science that have greatly improved diagnostics and treatment capabilities. Um, but in order to uh, practice these new methods, you, you need access to the latest technology and expertise. So small individual practices that are scattered throughout cities, they just cannot house the diverse equipment and staff that's required by modern medicine. So patients end up then being referred to separate specialists or diagnostic centers, and this creates inefficiencies and also discrepancies in diagnosis. The thing about the polyclinic, though, is that all these specialists are in the same place. They work together on cases, and patients aren't uh, referred to specialists that are then in different buildings. They don't have to travel to different buildings and wait uh, for available appointments. They also don't have to keep track of their own records because the polyclinic has its own a common filing system, which all the specialists can then access. And so there are a number of benefits to this approach. Uh, firstly, there's the medical benefit of interdisciplinary collaboration on cases. And again, this facilitates this integration of prevention, therapy, aftercare, and rehabilitation. And this basically helps to minimize inpatient stays in hospitals uh, and even prevent illness in the first place. Secondly, doctors also have access to uh, laboratory and medical imaging services, and this helps to cut down on delays and bureaucracy. And then there are also the very practical advantages. For example, the, the polyclinic can extend its operating hours uh, and continue to provide care even when individual doctors are sick or if they're on holiday. Pri private practices just struggle to do this. Um, and linked to this idea is um, that this polyclinic system also allowed doctors to couple their normal consultation hours with on-site visits. Um, and this could then be used to provide more extensive care. So in East Germany, for example, pediatricians could conduct regular checkups in kindergarten while other doctors were looking after the walk-in consultations in the polyclinic. Now, the other crucial aspect of the polyclinic was that um, the public employment of its staff. So physicians, nurses, and assistants were employed by the state, and they were then freed from their financial dependencies on the sick. Um, they enjoyed a secured position and a reasonable income, and this allowed them to focus first and foremost on prevention. But it's also worth noting that this transition from self-employment to public employment, it was a very gradual process uh, that took place over the GDR's 40-year existence. Uh, and this was also due to the fact that public employment was not embraced by all at the beginning. Um, there was resistance, you know, as I mentioned, there were these conservative physicians associations who had already been systematically opposing calls for the polyclinic in the 1920s, and they continued to do so after the Second World War. And the East German policymakers, they went about this problem basically by trying to demonstrate the advantages of the public outpatient model. And so that meant sort of expanding the technical capabilities and the laboratories in the polyclinic over time, 
uh, essentially creating sort of model projects uh, which would make the benefits evident. And as you can see on this graph here, um, the transition didn't take place overnight. You know, for many years, private practices continued to provide a large portion of outpatient care in East Germany. But over time, and with certain concessions to the physicians, it was possible to gradually win over medical professionals, especially as younger medical students uh, who often had working class and peasant backgrounds came to see the benefits of fixed employment and socialist health care in general. Uh, now, before I close, I just want to also emphasize that this transformation of healthcare in the GDR, it certainly wasn't a walk in the park. You know, um, from its very early years, East Germany was confronted with uh, several major challenges, uh, just to name a few. Uh, from the very beginning, um, Western sanctions were imposed on the East, and this greatly hindered the importation of modern medical technology and equipment. On top of this, uh, East Germany was alone footing the bill for Germany's reparations to the Soviet Union because the uh, capitalist powers suspended their payments in 1946, one year after the war ended. Uh, and then on top of this, the construction of socialism, which begins in 1952, is actually taking place with open borders to West Germany. And West Germany at this time was receiving, uh, I think, about 1.5 billion US dollars through the Marshall Plan. And these, the, the, this fact, these open borders meant that those physicians who were reluctant to give up the private practice model or who were trying to escape the denazification process in the East, they could just leave. They could just go West. And actually, uh, as a way of bleeding the GDR dry, West Germany would also, uh, it was act actively poaching East German doctors uh, with the promise of higher salaries. So you had this massive brain drain of uh, highly trained professionals whose education had been publicly funded in the East going westward. And it also has to be said that uh, an additional challenge was the internal economic disparities in the GDR, particularly in the final decades when uh, they struggled with to balance out investment and consumption. And this meant that medical uh, facilities also had to contend with outdated equipment or suboptimal structural conditions um, and so on. And so all this meant that East Germany faced significant economic constraints. And, you know, not all of its health objectives could be, could be achieved. We have to be honest about that. Uh, you know, compromises were made, for example, um, in the use of brown coal, which was the only native fuel source available to East Germany after the sanctions. But this brown coal was also a horrible uh, air pollutant. Or working conditions in the factories, for example, they were also strained by the necessities of reindustrialization after the war. And so there had to be these kind of compromises between economic and health policies, uh, and the, the officials had to weigh up the best way of going about it. So we can't think that eliminating profit from healthcare will solve all of our health problems. You know, they, they, they won't just disappear overnight. But I think what we should recognize uh, from this history is that social ownership and the centralized organization of health, industry, housing, and education, these are the preconditions for genuine policy debates. In other words, socialist planning is the framework for discussing and coordinating health objectives in relation to other social, economic, and political aims. So we're no longer just running around trying to fix market failures, as the liberal economists call it here, but we're actually consciously setting priorities and shaping society around people's needs, not profit. And this is exactly the approach that enables the GDR to progressively improve the health of the population over time, even in the context of limited economic resources and fierce competition with the capitalist West. So as you can see in these two final graphics here, infant mortality rates and doctors per 10,000 residents, you know, nothing happens overnight. It's a gradual process. But from a much weaker post-war position, the GDR is able to reach levels that are on par with other industrialized states by 1989. And it had done so with a system that was run by and for the working people. So they proved that an alternative is possible. Now, this was just a brief overview of our second publication. Um, the link is in the chat uh, if you want to look at the full version. I just want to briefly also recommend that on our website, we have a interview archive with filmed interviews that we do with um, those who actually built and sustained socialism in the GDR. It's a core component of our research, uh, and it means that we don't have to rely merely on Western academia, which, as we know, uh, is rather biased on these issues. Uh, so if you're looking for a good resource to hear about other aspects like occupational health care or vaccination strategies or maternity care, 
then I can definitely recommend uh, checking out that archive on our website. But uh, first of all, thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Matthew. I think that was very um, that was very interesting, and I think that we will we will pick up a lot of these components again in the uh, in the in the debates and in the other interventions. Um, you raised a lot of uh, important points. I mean, I don't know, talking about brain drain or social determinants of health. This is not none of that has you know none of that has lost its urgency or its um, its importance in this. Uh, in this day and age. Um, yeah, thank you for that. I think, I guess, another one, one other little component that we shouldn't forget is the GDR only existed for 40 years and also culture is difficult to change. Sometimes it's the hardest when you are talking about conservative doctors and no offense to any doctor who might be listening in, but uh, changing conservative cultural norms and traditions is an incredibly complicated, complicated project. So uh, adding that into all the other constraints, economic, et cetera, et cetera, um, I think also plays a very, plays an important role in building up um, a socialist healthcare system. I don't want to, I don't want to chatter on. Um, Sopo, we'd like to hear from you uh, about the experiences <clears throat> in Georgia. I know that you just co-authored co um, a study that talks about how what what happened in the transition so matthew was giving us matthew was giving us how the gdr tried to build up a system and what principles they used and the study that uh you just co-authored with a bunch of people in uh tbilisi is actually about what happened in georgia after in the transition to the current from the socialist georgia or from the soviet union from the georgia in soviet union to the current um system and so this is about yeah the privatization of the re dialing it all back and was that better or was that worse and what does it mean for uh for patients for healthcare workers and for the system and so please just go right ahead thank you for that introduction um i think matthew did such an amazing job putting it out there, what it was like, what were the main motivations and values in building socialist healthcare. Um, your study is incredible. I'm so impressed, actually. I'm like telling everyone about it. Um, so in Georgia, we, so while, while DDR was building 40 years of socialist healthcare, we were destroying healthcare for the past 30 years um, with the non-stop you know, experiments that were run in Georgia and continue to do so for the past 30 years. And so mostly like we don't have, um, our research not concentrated on what healthcare was like in such detail in during the Soviet Union. Our, uh, we are really just taking certain health indicators and then seeing what they are, look like now and comparing them to 1989, 1990. Um, at the same time, we're, what we did was look at the processes of privatization the next uh, the last 30 years. Um, and so um, the third last 30 years, first, so we have three different, it's called stages. Uh, the first stage is uh, what we just, we said was like zeitgeist. Like it's, it's the idea that uh, when Soviet Union collapsed, um, we should listen to international financial organizations and everybody was saying this is where you have to privatize and liberalize and it was mostly about the economy but the same kind of prescriptive uh, reforms were given overall so when you have um, this economic reforms, liberalization of like very rapid liberalization. It also was simultaneously what was happening to the healthcare uh, was similar to what was happening to the economy. So there, so we see them as part of the same process of liberalization and not separate from healthcare to the economy. Um, one of the first things was, you know, the rapid decline of, of funding. Um, you know, the entire system fell apart. It went to, uh, from per person, um, how uh, the, the finance, finances per person dropped to almost zero um, and because there was no money. There was also no, no government and no one coming out to pay uh, 
to pay like healthcare because there's no money at all. The government completely lost all ties to the Soviet Union. So if you can imagine, you know, baby being born without, you know, mother or father or anything, it's like survive. Um, and so at first, right, right when the Soviet Union collapsed, there was, you know, civil war. So there's moments, a couple of years when the World Bank, IMF are, are not here yet. And then they come in around 1994, 1995. Um, and then they, you know, they do the standard structural adjustments that they have done to everyone else, starting with Latin America. And that's what they say. But Georgians don't know anything. They have never really experienced the world outside of Soviet Union. And they're incredibly naive. Uh, they don't know how to defend themselves. They don't have any arguments. They have no one else leading them. No one, no other ideas dominate. And of course, there's no such thing as a left wing. And there's no like connections with sort of, kind of any kind of left or you know different kinds of thoughts that could be maybe connected to other movements around the world to give them any, any kind of different ideas. And so they blindly follow World Bank, IMF, and so on, all the international financial organizations. Um, but they actually lose favor around 1999, where you know World Bank starts to complain that they're not moving fast enough. <laughs> and actually, right afterwards, a couple of years later, we have you know the Rose Revolution, where the government gets overthrown peacefully uh, by Saakashvili, and then Saakashvili becomes even bigger reformer than the international financial institutions. So the first phase is just pharmacies get privatized. Um, and so, and then you have mostly it's people don't have any money. And so uh, even if it's called a state hospital, you still have to pay each doctor like a fee to even get seen. So no one's going to the doctors at all in 1990. At the same time, imagine a, a country that stopped one day, what kind of diseases that would be. Um, Matthew was speaking about total war concept and how what the situation was like in 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 Europe uh, and so so many um, health problems. Well, it was similar to that, except not during wartime, during peacetime, where even diseases that were cured before started occurring um, and needed to be ma managed. So one of the biggest examples we know in Georgia and also we know in Russia and other post-Soviet countries, of course, is tuberculosis. Uh, so you have uh, the international organizations stepping in to develop some kind of public approach to these sort of pandemic-like th things that could get out of control, right? Public health. The, what we have to worry about is like uh, diseases that are communicable. So communicable diseases are then dealt with different monies and funds and grants and so on, like usually, but non-communicable diseases really become as neoliberalism also progresses, capitalization, privatization is a personal responsibility, right? And so um, then this in the second phase with Saakashvili, who was so uh, radical in his approach, he surpassed all, this, all uh, markers that even the uh, reformers wanted. So this is another thing that's important to know about the post-Soviet uh, world is while we see it in Latin America and in other countries with structural adjustment programs that people are resisting, our governments were like, we're going to do even more than you're asking. <laughs> so like they wanted to prove their loyalty to the West. They want to prove their prove that their loyalty to to capitalism. And this is sort of the name, uh, the the you know, the the biggest religion that exists is like pro-capitalism, right? Is after the collapse of the Soviet Union, especially among the elites. And so uh, Saakashvili to prove his his weight and his reformer status, and this is around Bush years. And of course he also changes the flag and sort of goes with the whole war of, on, uh, against terrorism. And then also the the heyday of, of, of World Bank is during that time. And he takes on all those reforms and he starts going, you know, we're going to sell everything, sells off lots of hospitals, privatize, privatizes them. And there's also at the same time, there is no real help from the government. Like if you don't have money, you will just die. Saakashvili starts inducing a little bit of like targeted programs that grow. Um, and at the same time, we have to realize that all of social determinants have get, gotten worse. So the air is worse, the food is worse, 
Uh, people are using when there was in the 90s when there was no lights. They were using, you know, wood to burn in the house, um, tires, and so in every possible way, their life has gotten worse. Um, the the society, the cultural, economic, every kind of way we can describe someone's life psychologically, it's gotten worse. So social determinants are worse, and there's less of access to healthcare when you need it the most. And it becomes privatized even more rapidly in the early 2000s. When we approach 2012 and there's a changing government, one of the big promises was that they were going to have single payer, government funded healthcare, which they did enact. And that was really the only thing they ever said they did for a long time. Georgian Dream was like, we did the healthcare because it was really the only thing people really wanted. And that's the only thing they've actually done at that time. So very popular, but then it's too popular. People start using it. So it goes, they're sick. Well, you know, this is, this is the outrage because people are using it too much. And now it's like too much, too much, like costs are too high. Right. So they bring in the world bank again to like, what's going on? Why are the costs so high? Um, and there was, this report, which I love how they speak, they're like, uh, this fully funded insurance incentivizes both parties to use healthcare, you know? So it's like saying how the, the patient, you know, person wants to go to the doctor because they can, and as the same thing as the clinic trying to, as much as possible, steal money from the poor client, you know, poor client that goes in and has no idea about their healthcare. And so they have like these extra tests and these needless interventions to try to get as much money from the government. And they try to attempt to say this was sort of the same thing. You know, this was incentivizing both of them to act in this way of, of you know, using too much money. So they changed it to targeted. So now it's targeted, no longer universal, which is exactly what we do not want. Um, just to look at some of the numbers of what life has got, life has uh, brought the last 30 years of what has uh, changed. Uh, in morbidity in general has increased threefold. Things like uh, circulatory morbidity is five times, nervous system is like nine times, nine times uh, worse now, nine times bigger the, the uh, indicator. Respiratory, digestive, they have all risen. Cancer, almost everything pretty much. Um, and at the same time, healthcare, though it's privatized and the messy and horrible thing that we do have, it's incentivized doctors to increase while decreasing nurses. What I mean by this is, if we leave everything to the market and we don't have any kind of what Matthew said, consciously setting priorities, right? If we don't have anything like where we are, we care about people, we care about um, you know having a, a healthy workforce, you know, healthy people, society, and so on. If you don't have those priorities and you don't even believe that the central government should even involve themselves then you have the market deciding. The market has decided that most people want to be doctors because, of course, if you're a doctor, you're much more likely to get more money and have more control over your work. You're not going to want to be a nurse that makes 100 you know, euros a month or 150 euros a month. You work insane hours and you're still in the bottom of the hierarchy at the hospital and treated terribly. And you have no autonomy at work and no one cares about your your uh, opinions or ideas and no one asks you anything so really nobody wants to be a nurse of course and then you have three times more doctors than you need you need them and you have three times less nurses than you need and we know that like nurses are incredibly important to a good healthcare system so if we had to change, like it's from the 1989 to 1990 levels, we'd have to increase three and a half times the nurses to reach the, the current le the levels that were in 1989. It's gotten so bad. At the same time, just like Matthew said, while there's also a, a strain on worsening conditions for nurses in clinics and loss of power and money, 
and status and everything. We also have brain drain. There's a healthcare crisis in uh, the rest of the world and rich countries can just buy, they can just buy nurses from us. So Georgia spends money training them. They get experience in, in our healthcare system and yet they will go because it's you know free movement, right? And there's always even, I've, I've been told by an ambassador that we always accept nurses. We may not have visas for other professions, but nurses are in such high demand there's always room for nurses to migrate. And then you also have recruiters come and from Germany a lot and take these nurses back to Germany. And of course, as an individual on an individual level, their life you know, is gonna get much better because they're gonna get way more money and they're gonna be able to also support family back home. Maybe their life won't get better, but their, their paycheck will get better in that sense. And then we have, you know, as, a, as our nurses union, we have one of our nurses that is a care worker in Italy who makes 800 to 700 euros in Italy, but it's still a lot more than she was making 120 euros working here in Georgia. And she was a specialist and loved her job. She always wishes she could work in Georgia for the, the amount of money she gets caring for the elderly in Italy. And she can never see her family. And it's like, you know, very alienated world that she has um, and where she can't even, prof you know, uh, have her own profession, be, be in her profession because she's a caretaker, but also can't go home to Georgia. So there's there are many examples like that where health workers are not only in as working as nurses in clinics, but they're also working in different health workers like care workers in different people's homes, like taking care of the elderly. So this is what the the snapshot of what the world, what Georgia looks like at this point. Um, I don't see how things are going to get any better, though there is sort of the government start maybe starting to realize that free markets completely privatized. And we do have almost the entire health system is privatized. Like it's like over 90%, it's like 95%, I, I think. Can you imagine? Like this is, there is no public... Uh, not that many. There are like a couple of public clinics, but there there really is no public uh, sphere that you can even compare what it would look like with pri public or private. So one of the things we did at the beginning, we wanted to just compare what it would be, you know, public versus private. And then we just couldn't find any public. <laughs> it didn't exist. And so the only thing we really had was to, to go back to the Semeshko model, which is the Soviet Union model based on principles of taking care of each other and social determinants and seeing that it's a holistic approach that you can't just fix people at the clinic level, but you have to give them a decent home, you know, better environment. And so this is incredibly important, this different approach. Like Georgia in 1923, 1917 uh, was in a worse state than Georgia at 1991, yet, which having worse, um, worse health indicators and social determinants in 1920s, and then you, you were able to build and improve life expectancy and morbidity and health and pop and longevity, life expectancy, which was like 29 or 32 or something like that. And then you have much healthier population in 1989, 1990, and yet you manage to make them sicker in the next 30 years. So just look at the two different approaches. That's I will I will wait for questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sopo. I think that's a very well. It's I'm, I wasn't I'm not 100 percent sure that we had planned it uh, quite that way that we would come to a point where Matthew describes what is being built and you describe what is being destroyed. Um, it seems to follow like a certain, you know, like an arch of history here that is unpleasant. So I'm really hoping that Yannicke will pull it all together now. Uh, the Workers' Party of Belgium has long championed healthcare as one of its main causes. It's actually quite impressive and inspiration to us all. Uh, through its organization, the Medics for the People, um, this organization has been on the forefront for better care 
better working conditions, better access. And that actually for the last 50 years, I just read that it's been 50 years. So congratulations uh, on that. I think that was last year, the anniversary. So amazing. Um, and you have, uh, I've met a couple of the, of the doctors that work with your organization and you have actually created infrastructure to address all the shortcomings that you deal with in Belgium. Um, <clears throat> obviously after the, after the two presentations we just heard, we need to know what can we do? <laughs> what should we be doing under the current circumstances? Uh, short of short of bringing socialism back, which of course is one of the goals, but in the short term and in the current state um, that we are in, how you know what are the challenges? How do you operate in this neoliberal capitalist setting? And also, of course, please share with us what the focus is at the moment, like what you're currently prioritizing in your struggles. Um, yeah, so please take it away, Janneke. Okay. Thank you, Francisca, and uh, thank you for allowing me to speak here and uh, explain our vision on healthcare. I also have a presentation. I believe it will start uh, soon, but I will talk to you about um, the healthcare system in Belgium, um, of, of course, about our organization, Medics for the People, and then about how we see empowerment and uh, social action. Uh, I'm just waiting for my... PowerPoint. There it is. Thank you. Um, so this is the... So um, to start, I would like to explain to you all uh, a little bit more about the Belgium uh, healthcare system using this figure. Um, as um, the figure shows uh, different ways of providing healthcare, um, as you can see, public, private, non-profit and private commercial. Um, and it also shows different ways of funding healthcare, uh, public and private. So um, the Belgian system is uh, situated in the um, B um, point B. It's a non-profit healthcare system, and it's paid by uh, Social Security. Um, so in uh, 1945, um, under pressure of the working class and uh, of course, uh, the international context, um, the working class obtained a social security system. It is an insurance system, but it is um, publicly funded. So every adult gives a part of their income into a large pot and it is used to pay for uh, sickness, uh, retirement, uh, but also disabilities, uh, things like that. And uh, most people uh, were very proud of uh, this, this healthcare system. We have a lot of good staff, we have um, good access to healthcare. Um, but since, uh, since then, uh, since 1945, a lot, of, uh, a lot is happening. And especially in the last decade, um, we have seen a lot of uh, neoliberal measures uh, trying to break down the system. And that's um, why I put the blue arrows in place. So we have seen evolutions like uh, private clinics um, where uh, people have to pay more, um, but um, it's also funded by Social Security. Um, we have also seen, um, like, for example, um, in especially in the nursing homes, uh, a strong privatization. Um, where multinationals like Orpea, Armonea, they have a lot of nursing homes and uh, it's the people themselves um, who pay for them. Um, and then we have also um, a strong evolution um, toward, uh, private, towards private insurance. Um, so uh, many people in Belgium um, already have uh, extra private insurance uh, to pay for uh, the hospital because social security doesn't pay enough anymore uh, to cover uh, these costs. Um, so um, as uh, medics for the people, a lot of our actions uh, focus on protecting the social security system um, against the austerity um, that we face. Um, but um, we also need to think further, and um, that is about um, moving to the left and um, making a public health uh, system. So, um, 
the consequences um, of the current politics uh, on the healthcare system um, is that we um, see a two two tier medicine. So, um, for example, um, if you can pay more money, you can go faster to a specialist in his private practice. Um, we also see um, the system um, growing expensive and more expensive every year. So right now in Belgium, um, almost 20% of all healthcare expenses is paid by uh, uh, out of pocket uh, for the patients. Um, we also fe uh, face a serious lack of staff, um, despite the brain drain that we all already also do from other countries, um, but we, fear, uh, we uh, face a serious lack of nurses, we face a serious lack of uh, GPs, general practitioners, and it's uh, still growing um, because more and more people are leaving healthcare uh, to just do another job somewhere else. For example, we have more than, uh, we have tens of thousands of nurses um, who are trained as a nurse, but not working in healthcare anymore because they just have had enough. Um, we have also a big problem of overconsumption. Um, on one hand, underconsumption for uh, certain people, but on the other hand, overconsumption because it's uh, driven um, by money. And uh, for example, we are like, uh, ahead of the most scanned CT scans uh, of, of, of all of Europe because um, the hospital needs this uh, payment for the scans to survive. And it's all paid by social security. Um, we also have a serious lack of prevention um, and the fragmentation that was already talked about, um, a lack of cooperation um, between the different systems, for example, between uh, hospitals and primary care, but also, for example, during the COVID crisis, um, nurses from the hospital in the beginning um, wanted to go and help in the nursing homes. Um, because they they faced the worst problems there, but this couldn't be done. But because who would pay for them then? This was the important question. So um, these are problems that um, probably are very uh, recognizable to a lot of uh, European and Western countries. Um, and unfortunately, uh, um, we, um, we have now uh, big manifestations and strikes coming up um, all over Europe and uh, in a lot of countries. Uh, I just came back from Madrid where um, like patients and uh, GPs, they are rising up together to protect their public healthcare system. So I believe there is a lot of hope in uh, seeing these big manifestations and strikes. Um, so to continue, um, I want to explain you a little bit about Medics for the People and how we work. Um, we, have, we have 11 community health centers. It's um, all over Belgium. So as um, most of you know, um, Belgium is divided in two parts, three parts um, with different languages. There's the Northern Flemish uh, speaking part and the South is French speaking, but we have um, medical practices all over the country. And it's very important that this is one national organization because also um, splitting up social security in a Flemish speaking part and the French speaking part is very dangerous um, and we should not do it uh, to protect it. We have like uh, 250 people uh, working for us. These are GPs, general practitioners, nurses, uh, psychologists, receptionists, um, but also lots and lots of volunteers. Uh, we couldn't survive without our volunteers. And uh, of course, many more. And the difference is normally in Belgium, when you go to your GP, um, he is paid by performance, eh? so every time you go, you pay, and then Social Security uh, shall refund you. Um, and in our medical houses and some other medical houses, um, pay for the patients, it's free of charge, and uh, it's directly arranged with Social Security. 
the payments. So um, as Francisca mentioned, um, it exists since 1971. Um, and um, the origin lays in the uh, May uh, 1969 student protests. Um, there were um, young founders of the Workers' Party uh, who were students at the time, and they saw that uh, on the, uh, among many other things, that the uh, health system failed and they wanted to do something about it. They wanted to provide medicine um, that put profit, uh, that put people before profit. And so they started out uh, the first center in the workers' com community in Hoboken, uh, nearby the city of Antwerp because they really wanted to do something and they wanted to show, they wanted to, to, to put their principles into practice and show that it's possible to do, um, to provide a different kind of uh, medicine. So um, since then um, we have created the 11 medical centers and from the beginning it was very, it, it was very clear that these centers should, should also be uh, not only medical centers, but also centers of political action. So, um, so this was in the beginning. And of course, a lot of things have uh, changed in, since then. A lot of things has happened. And in 2022, also, um, because after COVID, we believed um, we had something to say about the organization of, of, on health, of healthcare. We published our latest mission statement, um, because health is a right. And so if you want to read more about it, you can always um, ask a publication uh, via our website. So, um, Sopo and um, Matthew already talked about it, but a lot of different factors influence our, our health. Um, so it's clear that um, as a healthcare worker, you can't always solve these problems within the walls of your practice. Um, and that is why um, we use empowerment as a strategy of uh, change. So, um, as you can see, there's a quote of uh, Che Guevara. He's a doctor and a revolutionary, so a good inspiration for an organization like ours. And he's, uh, he said that ensuring a strong body is not so much done by the skilled work of a doctor's hands on a weak body, but rather by the work of a whole community on a social level. So we talk about empowerment, um, but um, we also have to say that empowerment has become a malleable concept. So from the World Bank to neoliberal uh, governments, they all use the word, the word empowerment. And um, so what they, re what they really mean by it is um, solve your own problems. Um, so we won't have to bother uh, thinking about them or paying for them. Um, but we wanted to take uh, the term back and um, for us it means to help people and to make them stronger and to stand up for their for their rights. Um, in our mission statement we um, use a quote of a, a healthcare worker, an American healthcare worker, Irving Zola, and I just want to read it to you because I think it's very uh, beautiful. As doctors, we stand at the edge of a swirling river, river. We hear the cry of a man drowning and we jump into the river, put our arms around him, bring him to the bank where we give him artificial respiration. And just when he starts breathing again, we hear another cry to, for help and the whole scene repeats itself. We are so busy rescuing and resuscitating that we forget to go upstream and see who is pushing all those people in the river. Systemic rescuing means just that, moving upstream together with the victims and tackling the causes of their suffering. So, um, from the perspective of the patient, um, we see empowerment on four different levels. 
Um, the first one is involving the patients in shared decision making. So in the consultation, when we see patients, um, we try to take the decisions together with them, uh, not for them, but with them. The second one is also increasing critical awareness. So when somebody is sick, we try to explain them why they are sick. We also want to avoid guilt and uh, victim blaming. So we um, try to explain the social determinants. Um, we try to look at it uh, with a broad perspective to explain to them what makes them sick. Could it be bad housing? Could it be the environment? Could it be the working conditions? So we talk about those a lot with our patients. Then the third one is a collective. So we organize a lot of group sessions for uh, people with the same conditions to come together and to talk about them, to, to talk about it, to feel less alone, but also to see why they are sick and how they can stand up together to do something a bit about it. And then the fourth one, of course, is the uh, concrete action. And it is, um, it can be um, going together to a union manifestation. It can be um, protesting together with our patients against air pollution in a big city. Um, it can be long-term organizing a community around uh, lead poisoning. Um, and then um, we see in these concrete actions that it makes people stronger and their self-confidence grows. And it makes them also believe that uh, something can be done uh, about their destiny. All this means that as a healthcare worker, um, we um, are we have to evolve from only being a care worker to being a health activist. Um, so um, we have to approach people in their strength, and um, it's not easy because um, it is often um, learned to us that we see people as victims. We see them as too sick to do anything. Um, they can barely solve their own problems. So how can we ask them to go to a manifestation with us? So um, we have a lot of discussions around that. Um, and we also have um, the second point. Sharing is often a sustainable solution. We take a lot of time in our team meetings, in our medical uh, reunions to talk about um, why people are sick, to um, to explain our cases uh, to one another and to see if we have other cases like that. For example, um, we have seen uh, lots of patients after the age of 55 being unable to work and our government willing to uh, raise the age uh, for retirement to uh, six, uh, 67. So we have done, as, uh, we have decided to do a study um, about chronic illness uh, in people over 55 and to ask them uh, if they could uh, work any or if they couldn't work anymore and uh, then we published that and so we um, um, held the debate on uh, earlier retirement. So here you can see us um, in action at the parliament um, for people uh, who have long-term sickness uh, together with the union. And then, um, so the third one as a healthcare worker is um, we have to uh, put ourselves uh, on an equal uh, level uh, with the patients. So we can't think of ourselves as uh, higher than the patients of su or superior. Um, we have to um, work on a symmetric uh, relationship. And of course, the, for the fourth one is very important. Um, we work with the uh, Workers' Party on our sides, the PTB, um, um, because um, that's the party that's going for a different uh, economic system and it makes, our, it makes us stronger as an organization um, to work together and um, to... Um, to end my presentation, I would like um, 
to um, read to you a quote um, that was published in the Lancet in uh, 2018 by the editor-in-chief Richard Horton um, because it was the 200th anniversary, uh, anniversary of, um, of, the, of Karl Marx. And um, that's why also we are linked with the Workers' Party of, Be of Belgium. It is, um, he said, Marxism is a call to engage, an invitation to strengthen the struggle, to protect the values we share. We can conclude that medicine has a lot to learn from Marx. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janneke. I think um, I think your presentation really brought home a how complex uh, the struggle is for a better healthcare system and how it relates. Like just what Matthew and Sopo were both talking about, it was shown that it really is super complex and super complicated to do so uh, in today's sort of neoliberal environment. In today, in in, a, in an environment where healthcare is um, considered such a specific issue of, yes, curing sick bodies for profit, uh, where that is often convoluted as being healthcare, it really, it really strikes, it really strikes in your presentation how, uh, how much the, how much work your organization has to do to even raise the awareness around how the, how these things are interrelated and how it is necessary to I don't know, to struggle for to struggle for better housing, for better working conditions, for not having the, you know, the retirement age raised and how that relates to your daily health or your daily health care and your individual health. So I think um, it's it's very complex and it sounds like a lot of hard, uh, hard, difficult work. And I'm not 100 percent sure how well we are doing overall. I think um, we saw in the comments there has been quite a bit about a conversation about the brain drain. Uh, Sopo mentioned it. Uh, I think I would like to pick that up. Oh, wait, let's do a time check. Yeah, we have 20 minutes. We're totally cool. Uh, we are very good for time. Thank you for thank you for keeping to your allotted time slots, presenters. Well done. Um, and yeah, thank you all for the questions in the chat. Please uh, put up some more. We try to get to them. Um, let's start with I would like to hear a tiny bit more about the brain drain situation. We would assume, or at least I think this is what it sounded like a little bit, that Belgium and Germany, we know that, uh, are actually at the moment at the receiving end. We heard, uh, we saw in the chat already that um, the, the question of Cuba has been addressed. Uh, you know, obviously Cuba has probably been on our minds. I know that in the GDR study, Cuba is being mentioned because there is, it has been an inspiration um, uh, for the GDR system as well. Um, can I can we talk a little bit about brain drain for a minute uh, and how this is being how do we fight against that? Like what is a fair what is a fair you know what is a fair struggle? I mean we cannot possibly ask individual nurses the way that Sopo was explaining to not go to Italy, even though wages there are obviously also even lower than they are in Germany. We cannot ask individual nurses to make these sacrifices, but how do we address this? Um, uh, Matthew, do you want to start? I know the GDR is long gone, but they had a, they tried. Um, and maybe there's something in it that would be useful. Maybe there isn't. And then <clears throat> I think the question around Cuba has actually been answered in the chat uh, by Dr. Samira Adri directly, but uh, maybe we can, yeah, maybe we can talk a bit more about brain drain and then we'll get to the next question. So only only short answers from now on. Okay, then I'll be brief. Um, the issue of brain drain was something that affected the GDR, but uh, the GDR also was trying to help the young states in the so-called third world also overcome this issue. Um, and so, <clears throat> I'll talk first first about the how they how they helped these young states. So the GDR had agreements with national liberation movements to actually train personnel, medical personnel in East Germany, who would then return to their country and act as a kind of multiplicator or multiplier, whatever you want to, however you want to call it. So the idea was medical pedagogy. So they would be passing on their knowledge that they learned in East Germany to other health professionals or medical students there. 
the GDR actually had a, a medical school entirely dedicated to this. Uh, they had, I think, over 2,000 students. Um, they were then, you know, trained and then returned to their countries to act oftentimes as some of the first medical personnel at all, because when the colonial powers left, they took all of the medical expertise with them, leaving these colonies or former colonies in, in dire straits. Um, in terms of how the GDR dealt with its own brain drain, um, of course, as I said in the presentation, it had open borders with the West until 1961. And it tried to convince some of the, these conservative doctors by making concessions uh, at some point um, in the form of, for example, promising um, doctors that they could uh, pass their private practices along to their children. Um, and so sort of prolonging this private practice model that they were actually trying to transcend. Um, but they were making these concessions to keep the doctors interested. Um, and uh, the long-term goal, basically, uh, to combat the brain drain was training a new generation of doctors. So especially prioritizing young children from working class and peasant backgrounds and prioritizing their ed medical education so that you also break down this sort of monopoly on education that the medical intelligentsia had, uh, traditionally in Germany at least. Uh, and so these were the kind of the two approaches that, that was pursued. But maybe I'll leave it there so that I don't eat up too much time. Well, do you want to add something? Do you want to talk a little bit more about that topic? Me? Do you, do you say yeah, so? Yeah, I'm asking you just because it seems yeah. so, it seems so uh, problematic in, like, basically Georgia is being reduced to the state of being a country like that was once so advanced and now is in that situation again where actually there's less medical personnel than there used to be. So I was just wondering whether this is part of your struggle in your union, how to address this. Yeah, that's a huge problem because, uh, you know, I was saying like, even if we manage to get four or five times the pay raise that they have now, it still wouldn't be equal to European prices. So it's like we're really just... There's even limitations in that sense of union struggle if you're going to ask for 500% increase, right? It's, I mean, it still wouldn't be enough. Um, so it's a huge problem. There's not only just the immigration, just like cross borders, but internal migration where regions are being emptied because there are not enough, um, well, healthcare facilities because there are not enough people or if there are enough people they don't have money, so you're not gonna open up clinics or at least even have more advanced hospitals because you're like, oh, well, these people can't afford it anyway. So you're gonna concentrate most of your clinics or hospitals in the city, in the capital, therefore draining away all the um, the, the staff, like hotel, like hotel, um, hospital, <laughs> too many workers, confusing. Um, hospital staff are coming from the regions as well and so then you have even less people and then the prices are even lower. So usually the the um, the wages are much lower in the regions because of that as well. So there's internal problems where really has been like Tbilisi like sucked like everything out of out of the rest of Georgia. So there's only one city thriving at the detriment of the entire country. And then um, the second step is usually, you know, migration abroad. We want to do a study where we will really start to look at the patterns with uh, recruiters and immigration. Because as far as I understand, there's absolutely no tracking of people, no tracking of nurses, how many are going, where are they going, are they ever coming back, nothing. Uh, so that needs to be done, that kind of, just to get a picture of what's, because I just know anecdotal things, like what we follow, what we know, what we, but we don't really have the numbers per se. Um, and so that needs to be tracked. I don't know. I don't have answers to how that we could combat that. Like, I mean, I don't, <laughs> every situation it's having to, either you have to pay a lot of money for people to stay somewhere they don't want to stay, right? So like regions, say high mountainous areas, you're gonna have to really give so much money and then there's no infrastructure around them either. So even if they get to be a doctor in some remote region, there's nothing else around to even have a life. So you're kind of asking people to live sort of ascetic, like monk-like uh, life 
which I don't see a lot of people agreeing to. And the second, we don't have money to offer them. So really, then you have to find some like dedicated you know, person who's willing to risk everything. And now those are so rare. And you can't actually base an, an, a program or, or a plan on people's willpower to overcome every single obstacle ever just to do this. Um, I don't see it other anything else but some restrictions. Like I just see restrictions as one of the ways that you can sort of help this process, I think, or maybe even have like, you know, if you're going to finish nursing, you have to stay here for five years in the region or something, some kind of exchange. I don't have, I don't really have thought about this in this sense because I know it's a really difficult um, subject. So I'm trying to get a better picture of it. What could be done besides like restriction, which works, but then, you know, all this other then, but then it's like the, the age of individual, like, <laughs> to pursue our, our lives and so on. So it's like really hard to limit the individual at, at, in this day and age, you know, to tell them to like stay and not pursue something else. Hmm. But that is, it's interesting because that is in a way also something that Yannicka says when she talks about the internal difficulties, we are not just talking about how internally regions may be perching each other and certainly, certainly like the, the, the cities, like the rural areas are even less serviced. I mean, that's, I think we've, we see that everywhere. But Janneke was even mentioning that people who have been trained in the, in the healthcare professions, like as nurses, for example, don't even work in their professions. So what is the, so you have even, you have, you have there sort of a term of a, a kind of a brain drain that just goes to other jobs because it is so, um, I don't know, underappreciated, such a hard job. Uh, that it's not even that it doesn't even make sense for people who have been trained in the field. How? But this is interesting because Yannick, when you say that you have the eleven healthcare uh, cent, like that you have these clinics, how do you motivate people? You say you work a lot with volunteers. You know, how do you motivate? How do you motivate people to come together? Maybe this is helping. Maybe this will help Sopo to develop like some amazing clinics in. Uh, in Georgia to to address the issue in rural areas. How do we motivate people to do what you're, again, you're doing it in Belgium. There's different challenges than there is in Georgia, for sure. And surely the the your organization, as well as the party, are lobbying the government for better healthcare spending and more healthcare spending, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but how do you motivate people on the ground? Um... I think for um, for medics for the people, um, Belgium is a very urban country, so mm -hmm. we don't have a lot of very rural areas. But still, we have a difference. Like even within our organization, finding doctors for the cities is uh, less hard than finding doctors for the uh, more rural areas. So. Um, and I, I guess the the answer to um, to the the brain drain within a country is is within the the public health system because as an organization, for example, we can uh, specifically discuss with doctors, ask doctors uh, to go to another uh, healthcare center to help out there. And um, if imagine if you have it on a bigger scale and you can you can uh, motivate people to go to another practice and um, to practice medicine there and it it actually works we can um, we can arrange within our L 11 uh, healthcare centers um, the more distant centers we can help them to survive um, and uh, by working together and finding doctors but i guess um, the most important important thing to motivate people is the the, the vision itself um, and um, engaging in action um, together to realize that vision because I think that when uh, for example I saw a, a, an item on TV uh, last week or the week before about uh, Indian nurses being employed in um, a nursing home um, in, uh, in, in Brugge, in Belgium, and um, they had to learn the language and it was like a very optimistic uh, item. Um, but 
we we have to work with the, the people who come here to to explain our vision about public health care and to engage them in uh, the struggle for better working conditions. So that's one thing we have to do and we have to um, fight together for, for a better healthcare system here and abroad. And I think what is also important for an organization like Medics for the People is um, to have um, international solidarity in our um, activities. So, for example, we have now um, one person coming back from Turkey um, who visited the, the, um, the areas of uh, the disaster. And um, we are organizing in uh, many cities uh, together with the working uh, party, with the workers' party, um, solidarity meals to collect funds to help uh, organizations over there. But we have also in April uh, uh, and May a group of young doctors going to Cuba, um, looking at the healthcare system over there, learning from it, and at the same time de developing uh, international solidarity in our practices with our patients, collecting medical material um, and uh, asking patients to give something for that. Um, so that is something we consciously, uh, consciously uh, work on as well. Thank you. Um, I'm just thinking about which questions we should take that everybody can speak some more. Um, there is a there was a question very early on, and maybe Matthew can answer it very briefly uh, about about psychology and how mental health stuff was dealt with in the GDR. I know that this is not so much explored in the study, and I don't know if you can answer it, but maybe you can say two words uh, just to respond to the uh, questioner. Yeah, um, I would just briefly say that, um, unfortunately, I, I can't answer that question in too much depth. I mean, our study primarily looks at the outpatient system in the GDR. Um, but I would say, in general, we have to be a bit careful using today's standards uh, and applying them to the past. Um, not saying we shouldn't do it, but we just need to be careful when we do it. Um, and as Francesca also said in the beginning, uh, it is difficult to actually overcome these prejudices, uh, these cultural prejudices that we have towards a certain uh, ailments uh, or even medical professions. Um, I'm not too sure about this. Uh, what the, I think the question was about the disdain for psychology. I, I can't say much about that, but I do know that one of the pioneering fields in the GDR was actually occupational psychology. So they were looking at this, uh, the question of how, how does work why is work alienating or how is work alienating in a in a industrialized society and how do we go about addressing this problem and uh, i do know that there was quite a bit of research but it was only applied in the gdr in a limited manner but again you know it only existed for 40 years so who knows if it had carried on then maybe they would have applied this more um, widely but um it was it was definitely a field that that was being researched, uh, but I I, I, can't, I can't say it was a priority. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, there is a question about that also came up in the chat about uh, whether there was um, whether in the research around the USSR and the GDR whether or in Georgia whether there were. Um, uh, wh whether there were approaches that were shared, whether there's actually like public, whether public policy was made together by the USSR and the GDR or by the individual states. Um, I don't know if uh, Sopo or Matthew know anything about that. And again, it is generally about the, like the, the prevention, uh, the preventive uh, methodology of healthcare that was the, the goal or was the uh, driving force um, in, in that time in the socialist, uh, in the former socialist states. Uh, is there any documentation of this as official policy or is there anything that was coordinated at government level? I don't know if either of you can speak to that. Sopo, do you know? Um, I don't know the exact like documents or anything like that, but the approach is exactly the same. There might be differences, but the polyclinic being central to the healthcare, preventive care being number one and prioritized, prioritizing social determinants in almost every possible way. This is what socialist healthcare looks like. Same in Cuba and in many other places that has been tried. So what we can say for sure 
is this approach that at every level it should be outside of the individuals like oh if i remember to go to the doctor if i have enough money so it's mostly like from the beginning when you're born from the hospital to school you're getting checked to when you start working at the factory or whatever you're getting checked um so everywhere there are these yearly checkups prevention and one of those things i didn't say was like in post uh, soviet georgia um nine times less preventative checkups with doctors now so nine times less and so then you see how the the illnesses are much higher and cancer especially is about prevention right catching it early is, is life saving catch it late a lot of people die from cancer here is because they're not going to the doctor until it's too late um and so prevention is is very much key and also in um we also had you know the whole system around occupational care and i really love this occupational psychology that you mentioned um I'd love to this is like actually one of my like passions but it really is like this idea that rest is necessary you know because of course it's like a marxist sense because we know that like people are exerted and that's what what value is right it's exertion of the physical body at work so then you're trying to do everything to help this person you know become whole again and and live their best life and so you had sanatorium systems where you can vacation and have baths and care in other different way you know with leisure you had rest homes and i actually made the case and i would actually like that's maybe beyond today but one of the things i actually looked at and which which the imf sort of world bank and continuous privatization constantly says we don't need these hospital beds and they're always destroying hospitals and selling them off hospital beds were too much too much too much but i look at it as um the hospital system was also assuming that like at home you may not get that kind of care uh because you might have you know if you have to take care of if you're like you know a woman working age you might have to take care of your child or your mother that's living with you or your husband so like being in the hospital for long periods actually gives you that time where somebody else is taking care of you so you are not doing all these things at at home so i look at the de- demolishing of hospitals as an anti-woman thing where care work for sick people by focusing most on outpatient there's no such thing as purely outpatient right i mean you always knew, like every time i've ever been to the doctor or something you get this like you need to rest for four days you need to eat this you know the who's taking care of you in that time it's your mom it's your wife it's your you know maybe if you're lucky your husband or any kind of man but really it's it's women that are then ending ending up I know so many of our workers will cannot go somewhere or have to take time off work and we actually fight for medical leave from from work that you, if your parents get sick or if they have surgery for you to be able to leave and then take care of them. And this is actually I know so many people say like oh my aunt got surgery I've been taking care of for 3 months at my house. So I I see that, you know, like I don't like fetishize this outpatient service that I feel like sometimes it's like what they always want like oh you don't need to be in the hospital and hospitals are bad. I look at hospital the original concept of hospitals for poor poor people who didn't have a home where they could also get money for food or get food and a place to sleep. So to me in this world where it's actually harder to get homes and have enough like at least in Georgia have the the kind of lifestyle or like living standards that that would be you know suitable to be at home if you don't have that i think hospitals are even more important during this time and also this care work as i said like this care centers like sanatoriums this rest rest areas and there's so many rest areas sanatoriums in georgia that like are now decaying or become five star hotels or something but amazing palaces palaces really with like you know warm baths and like sulfur and massages or whatever for you to feel better and especially if you worked really hard jobs like mining you got even more privileges of like going to that so i think that's really important the approach is is holistic it's it's about person and understanding that under capitalism the worker is the labor power so it's like it's co- coming from that so i think that would be it what it seems like from the studies the same thing Yeah. 
Um, I think you raised an important point to which we really will not get today, but of course there's a whole layer to this from to look at to look at healthcare from a feminist perspective and see how socialist healthcare dealt with an issue that is, you know, that a lot of feminists now actually talk about how underserviced uh, women actually are in our in our current healthcare situation and healthcare system, including including that much of the care work and many of the nurses that these are still gendered, very gendered jobs, uh, and that there's a lot of, yeah, that, so there, there is like this, this underserviced and overworked. So there's like all these, uh, double and triple, um, uh, uh, things to endure. So there's a whole other, there's a whole other session in there on socialist medicine and women or how that, how that worked out. Um, I think we can, yeah, we can, we can take some time and think about whether we want to talk about that in a different session because i think it would be very very interesting because a lot, again like you were have you have been explaining to us Sopo, a lot had been gained and a lot has been lost in the former socialist countries in terms of reproductive care in terms of health care uh, uh, for women and in general um, women's accomplishments and achievements um, <clears throat> I know we're running out of time now, like first we did so well and now we're running out of time. So I'm thinking that maybe we should move to <clears throat> sort of final statements. And I think we'll do it. Um, um, somebody raised the question about uh, reform or revolution. And I think we will not link this to any party or organizations. I think we will just, uh, we would really like to hear how how is your inner personal revolutionary dealing with all of this? And how would you like to how would you like to see the healthcare system in your current country, in your current region? How would you like to see it changed? Um, and yeah, do you think it can be done via a gentle reform, or are you full out on there? And you know, this is this is your personal answer. I'm asking Sopo, Matthew, and Janneke, and I'm not asking the organizations that you work for. So you can just you know let it all out and speak for yourself. Let out all the frustrations. Matthew, do you want to start? And then, uh, Yannicka, and then Sopo. Yeah, I can. Um, I think I would just uh, briefly also say that um, concluding on this uh, on the, the panel discussion, I think um, it's important that we are not afraid of looking at our past experiences and that the, pra uh, the practices of what they call real existing socialism. You know, I think we can't write these these years off as uh, failures because there were some shortcomings or mistakes were made and this kind of stuff. So I think um, we should really try to reclaim this history, make use of it and learn from its ups and its downs rather than just writing it all off and ignoring it. Um, now to the question of what uh, Francisca asks, I think I would probably say that um, I think we should be careful about just taking individual aspects of uh, socialist healthcare systems and then integrating them into capitalist society and thinking that that will work, you know, like taking the polyclinic, for example, and just building it in Berlin today, um, which, by the way, some people have tried and it doesn't work uh, because the profit motive is, is, is just crushing. Um, so I think what I would say is that if we are going to have an effective and thorough transformation of healthcare, it has to be linked with a larger political project. And uh, I think that's also what's remarkable about the Medics uh, for the People campaign in Belgium is that it is linked with the, with the Workers' Party, with the PTB, and it is part of this larger project to transform society. Um, and so I would just probably highlight that we need to keep these two connected, you know, concrete gains in the here and now, but also long-term political objective. And as part of that long-term political objective, I think that at the center has to also be property relations. You know, we have to ask the question, uh, who is owning what? Uh, and if we look at states like the GDR or Cuba, this was kind of the key to realizing this idea of health in all policies. You know, if we're serious about integrating health into all areas of society, we have to recognize that public ownership of all major institutions is the fundamental prerequisite, you know? So I don't think we should settle for any half measures here. Um, and capitulate to what Sopo was talking about with this sort of demonization of centralized organization. Um, so I think that, it, you know, even if it's a gradual process, we should still have the long-term goal of socialization of property relations, because this is what is going to really deliver comprehensive health care for the people. Thank you. 
final statement, Janneke. Yes. Um, so um, I would like to explain, I'm wearing a badge today. I will show it closer to the camera. I hope you can see it. It's in French, so I will translate it. It's a batch from the Workers' Party because last month um, we had a, a manifestation uh, of the healthcare unions. Um, and the batch says, Les soins c'est du travail à la chaîne. And they uh, crossed uh, à la chaîne and they wrote uh, humain. Donc, um, uh, care is uh, um, not... Um, uh, chain production, but it's a uh, human work. Um, it is basically basically saying that, and that would be um, what I want to change in healthcare: that patients uh, can be no longer numbers, um, and that uh, caregivers can can be uh, no longer seen as uh, machines that have to produce something. Um, so I think we need a more um, human perspective on healthcare and um, that is what we, what we fight for with medics for the people but and, and with the workers party but um, we also see that everything um, that we gain is um, limited in time um, unless we change the whole system so it's very important to see that um, we also need to co go further than uh, just change some things but we have to go uh, for a system change and um, with the workers party we have a method for that and we call it street council street or street, 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 street. But at, like at the moment, we have two of our doctors in the parliament and um, they they function as a, as a speaker for the action in the street. So when we do something, they talk about it in parliament, but without the action in the street, without the manifestations of the unions, without uh, um, the civil movement, um, going for action, they can't really do anything in the parliament and um, they need that uh, civil movement, that union movement um, to come into action and um, just to um, to realize uh, these measures um, for care not, no, not longer being uh, um, a productive item and, and be, being more human. So I think that's my statement. Thank you, Anneke. Sopo. Yeah, so I'm definitely for completely overhauling all of private care to only being public and, you know, similar systems. I think maybe, you know, now we know more so we can actually improve so many of the mistakes that Soviet Union or GDR made. And I think we actually have a even better um, standpoint, a position to really work from. And especially because there is also technology, but also so much knowledge has been accrued. And everything that we've been saying or before was maybe not not able to be evidence-based, now really is evidence-based in a lot of ways. So I think like, you know, even basic things like food, when, you know, manufactured food that we really shouldn't be eating, you know, things from a box that's been, you know, the past 30 years, tons of these products have been coming into Georgia, ruining also even the diet and diet is incredibly important to health. So there's so many things that I can discuss that we should be changed. So I work on changing these things now, but I don't see how, like Matthew said, I think that's sort of taking some kind of socialist trying to make it work in a capitalist system. We can, um, I think workers, especially in Georgia, are so beaten down. So any kind of relief for them would empower them to then be able to fight for a better world. So I do believe in reforms in the sense that I don't think the most like poorest, most beaten down people, I don't think they're a revolutionary subject. Like generally, usually that time is when you're just trying to survive. So actually getting people some things um, for them just to be able to have, see that they're worth more than that life has given them actually, I feel like ignites them to want something, you know, it sort of whets the appetite for what could be. 
Um, and so I, again, like what the work we do with, and actually I'm so impressed with Mike's for the people as well. I just want to say like, you are my, um, you're one of my heroes. Um, and I met Sophie last year. So I was like very impressed. Um, and so I think like that kind of work is incredible. Like I wish we had that in Georgia. I really wish like doctors were, they're really conservative here. You know, like just even having small things like doctors being able to go work with PHM or even have like exchange programs with, with you in Belgium, just to see what it's like, I think would do a lot because I do think doctors, even though I think they're the most reactionary out of the healthcare sort of or staff personnel generally, because they make the most money, but nurses, doctors, and so on, they should be um, learning more about the, where there are experiments, where there are these attempts to change things. Because right now it's like virtually 100%, you know, pri or some people may be like, oh, public-private mix, and that's that's good enough. And that's what the world is all going to, public-private mix. And this is what the best we can hope for. So I think we can do more. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sopo. Oops, I just disappeared for a moment. I didn't hear your last words, but I hope you'll tell me. Um, uh, thank you so much. Thank you, all three of you, for staying with us until the end. Uh, thank you for all the people who dialed in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. A huge thank you to People's Dispatch. Um, I know that this is always very hard on the People's Dispatch crowd at the at the crew for the crew, because it's really late in India. Uh, so thank you for helping us and supporting us. Um, I think that we can say that we raised more questions than we had answers today. I think there is a lot more to discuss, uh, all the all the complications, all the changes that are necessary. But I really do hope that we get to a point, maybe we can talk about some of those aspects again, and maybe we can uh, figure out a, a way to exchange um, some of that knowledge and some of that expertise and um, create some more synergies working together to at least make things better slowly but surely and then get ready for the real thing. Uh, thank you very much and good night, everybody, and see you soon. Goodbye. Thanks very much. Bye.